today, once again, is a Philippian Sunday. And so let me invite you to turn to Philippians chapter 1. Just to give a little review from where we came from last week, we noted that to be a, a true community or to be a, an association or a group or a club, whatever you want to call it, means that narrowness is inevitable to some degree. But if you're a community that is regularly dealing with matters of life and death, not only is narrowness inevitable, inevitable, but it is essential in areas of life and death. And we saw last Sunday that the Apostle Paul talks about some issues of life and death. And that is why in Philippians chapter 1, he, he narrowly talks about what the gospel is, what the gospel isn't, and he calls the church at Philippi to do the same, to be narrow concerning what the gospel is, why Jesus died on the cross, what that does for us, our, our need of his atoning death. And just in case we or the church at Philippi is tempted to be arrogant in our narrowness, just in case there's a temptation to be smug, Paul immediately says a couple of things that humble us. Number one, that our salvation is not of us. It is from God. Our salvation is from God. And secondly, he tells us that we will suffer. And that brings us full force into today's subject of suffering. And so we aim to look at two verses this morning. Philippians 1, verse 29, and then we will get into verse 30. And so would you read this passage with me? Again, Philippians 1, 29 to 30. What, what does the apostle say in these two verses? And what does the apostle mean in these two verses? Follow along with me. Verse 29, For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in Him, but also suffer for His sake. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Join me in prayer. Father, would you show us this morning what these words mean? These words inspired by your Holy Spirit and written down with pen and ink by your Apostle Paul. Forgive us when we forget that your word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Forgive us when we just have a cavalier attitude that we can slip in and slip out of church without your word penetrating our very hearts. And along with that, we ask that you would penetrate us, that we would leave here a transformed people. And so right now, Father, we humbly ask that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you would cause our hearts to come alive to your word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if this morning's message has one central sentence by which I think the Apostle Paul is bringing out of these two verses, it would be this. Suffering is simply the byproduct of gospel clarity. And I want to look at two points as we consider these two verses, and they're on the back of your bulletin. Number one, the gift of suffering. And number two, the kind of suffering. And so let's jump in and look, number one, at the gift of suffering. First of all, why would this be our first point? Where do we see suffering in the text as being given to us as a gift? Because some of you are already thinking, I'm not sure this is the kind of gift I want. Well, look at verse 29. And if you're the kind of person who underlines or highlights things in your Bible, you might want to highlight the word granted. Verse 29, For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in Him, but also suffer for His sake. 
And that word granted literally means given as a gift of grace. It's the Greek word charizomai. And in that word, if you think you hear the word charis, you're hearing correctly. Some of us know that the word charis means grace. And so this charizomai, this gift of grace, is something that is bestowed upon us as a favor, as an unconditional gift. And so Paul, therefore, is pointing out two things that is a grace gift. You'll notice in verse 29, number one, he's pointing out that the fact that we believe upon Christ has been granted to us. It is a gift of grace. And that's usually what we think of when we think of a gracious gift concerning what God gives us. We usually think of the ability to believe upon Him. That's a grace gift. But he also says your suffering is a part of this gift. Paul presents suffering on the, on the same level as he presents being able to believe upon Christ. In other words, suffering and salvation are part of the same package. And earlier this week as I was looking at these two verses, it dawned on me that in verse 29, the Apostle Paul is not asking the church at Philippi if they will suffer. It's not presented as a choice. It's not presented as a decision to be made, as if Paul is addressing the average Philippian Christian and then has in mind the serious Philippian Christian, the more hardcore Christian, and saying, those of you who are more serious and more devoted, perhaps you would consider suffering for Christ. That's not it at all. He's saying no matter who you are, if you are in Christ, you've already been granted a grace gift of suffering. Whether you have asked for it or not. Whether you would prefer it or not. In fact, the New Testament commentator Ralph P. Martin notes this, the Philippians were called, quote, not only to the privilege of believing in Christ, which is itself a gift of God, but equally to endure pain for Christ. And so our our suffering is a grace gift. If we know Christ, we've been given this gift. If your Bibles are turned to Philippians 1, you might want to turn just a page over and look at Philippians 3 for just a moment. Because Paul continues to package suffering sort of like a gift when he talks about sharing in Christ's suffering. Look at chapter 3, verse 10, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and may share in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death. You know, one of the most important questions we could ask one another is, who are your heroes? If someone tells you who their heroes in life are, you immediately know the general trajectory of where they're going. And whether a person has grand vision for life or sort of mediocre vision for life, you know where they're going by who their heroes are. Whether a person uh, is aiming for godly things or aiming for just carnal things, you know where they're going by who their heroes are. And so who are your heroes? Are your heroes uh, certain music artists, certain authors? Are the heroes in your life certain ministers, certain bloggers, certain entertainment celebrities, certain people that you see flipping through Forbes magazine? Whoever our heroes are, are the people that in time we will not only imitate, we'll talk like them, we'll dress like them. And we see this happening in in Paul. Paul was of such a unified affection with Christ that he wanted everything that Christ was a part of, even that he should suffer the way Christ suffered, that he should expand and endure things to build God's kingdom the way Christ did. 
And by the way, those of you, especially younger people this morning, let one of your regular prayers be, Dear God, let my affections be to have godly heroes. Turn my heart to have heroes in life that aim for godly things and and that aim to serve others. That's the kind of hero I want. Open my heart to find those kinds of heroes, obviously with Christ being at the top of the list. Once again, I say all of this because for Paul to suffer for Christ, to follow in his footsteps, that itself was a gift. But Paul is not presenting this as just for him personally. He's saying, this is your gift as well, church at Philippi. This is a gift that you have to suffer for Christ. And each of us have been given this gift of suffering. It's inevitable. Which means we don't have to go looking for suffering. Just as sure as our ability to believe in Christ was a grace gift... Our suffering is a grace gift. Which means if our salvation is in the right place, our suffering will be in the right place. If we are, have no questions about our salvation, we'll have no questions about our suffering. But what does that mean? Verse 29 again, For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in Him, but also suffer for His sake. What, again, does that mean? We, we, we need to keep asking, asking, asking. Have we suffered the way Paul is describing? Have you suffered the way Paul is describing? That's a hard question. That may be a question none of us know exactly how to answer. But thankfully, Paul does not leave us wondering. And that's why he gives us verse 30. And that brings us to The second point, the kind of suffering. So as as we're about to look into verse 30, notice that Paul clearly is talking about suffering in general. He's not saying that your suffering specifically is going to be imprisonment. He's not saying that your suffering specifically, church at Philippi, is going to be being rejected by your family, being disowned by your friends. Um, being burnt at the stake, being laughed at. He gives no specific fill-in-the-blank for this is what your suffering is. Our sufferings can be in numerous ways. So suffering as far as the specific kind is not Paul's point. Just to give us the flow again, look at 29 and 30 together. And, And pay special attention to verse 30. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in Him, but also suffer for His sake. Verse 30, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. The same. Same conflict, not the same outcome. Or to say that differently, instead of zeroing in on Paul's imprisonment and studying his imprisonment so that we can be prepared to be imprisoned ourselves, that's not Paul's point at all. His point is, what was the conflict I was involved in? That's the suffering that you need to be a part of as far as the reason for it. And so a good question to ask at this point is, what was Paul's conflict? What, why was he imprisoned? Why was he arrested in the first place? If he's saying, join me in this conflict that I still have, then we need to find out what his conflict was. Thankfully, chapter 1 shows us. Look at verse 16. Back up just a little bit. Look at Philippians 1, verse 16. This is the section where he says, Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, others from goodwill. We saw that a few weeks ago. Right message, wrong motive. But then in verse 16 he says, The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. There it is. I am put here for the defense of the gospel. 
That's why Paul was arrested. That's his conflict. As he tells us to be engaged in the same conflict as he is, and we ask the question, what conflict is that? He just answered it for us. I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. And that's important. Whatever that means, that means he's calling us to be a part of that same defense of the gospel as he was. He's not asking us to chase after suffering. He's asking us to join him in the defense of the gospel. That's the conflict he was involved in. And so, if you're looking in your Bible at verse 30, you know, of the numerous Bible translations that I went through this past week, every translation uses the word defense there or a derivative of it. Maybe defending might be in your translation. Uh, And the word in English is unanimous. I, I never found a translator who used something different, for good reason. In Greek, it's the word apologia, which means to give an answer or to explain. I am put here for the defense of the gospel. In other words, Paul is saying, I am put here because I explained the gospel. I am put here because I declared the gospel. I am put here because I I said who Christ is and what He did on the cross and why that matters. That's the defense of the gospel. It's where we get the word apologetics from. It's when we say why we believe what we believe. And so this is what Paul is saying. He's narrowing it down for us, if you will. And so when we read verse 29, that we will suffer for the sake of Christ, we need to realize how misinformed we can be if we do not go to verse 30. Because suffering is not the point. In fact, suffering for the sake of Christ may not be the point either if we just think for the sake of Christ or in the name of Christ sort of justifies anything that I do. You know, some crazy things have been done in the name of Christ, quote-unquote. I mean, this this was the fuel for the crusades of the 12th and 13th century. For the sake of Christ, we're going to take over the world. We're going to gain dominance over Islam. We can all think of some horrific things that were done for the sake of Christ or in the name of Christ. That's why Paul moves forward to verse 30 and he narrows his focus by saying that suffering for the sake of Christ means specifically any adverse outcome because you clarified the gospel. The kind of suffering I'm talking about is pure and simply the byproduct of gospel clarity. You don't go looking for suffering. You simply be faithful. You are to be faithful to explain Christ as He truly is and why He came. Again, I am put here for the defense of the gospel. That's what Paul said. So, we don't have to write a new script. We don't have to think of anything new or fancy. Our our job that the Apostle is calling us to is to be faithful to not just declare the Gospel, but to explain the Gospel, to defend the Gospel. Suffering is simply the byproduct of Gospel clarity. Let me illustrate that in a couple of ways. There was a world-famous violinist some of you may have heard of by the name of Fritz Kreisler. He died in 1962. And Kreisler, because he was not only a concert violinist, but also composed his own pieces of music, was a very wealthy man. And he was also a very generous man. He gave away a lot of his fortune as he toured the world. Unfortunately for him he once saw the one item that he prized more than any item. And I don't remember the specific vintage or year of this violin, but he came across a collector who had 
a violin that he had always heard about. And it was an extremely expensive violin. And so Chrysler wanted that violin, but it was just after he had given a lot of his money away, so he couldn't afford it. He works and does more concerts to build up his fortune again so that he can purchase this violin. He hunts down the collector, and he offers the collector an incredibly sum of money to purchase this masterpiece violin. And the collector didn't want to sell. He said, this has become my prized possession. It's not for sale. And Fritz Chrysler was literally in this collector's mansion, just defeated, heartbroken, that he wouldn't sell it. It's just part of his collection, along with all kinds of other instruments, one of many. And before Chrysler left, he had an idea. And he asked the collector, could I just play the violin one time in this massive foyer of your home? And reluctantly, the collector let him play the violin. And Chrysler filled that entire mansion with such beautiful music that the collector, in desperation, said, I have no right to keep that instrument for myself. It's yours, Mr. Chrysler. Take it into the world so that all nations may hear it. In a similar vein, the name of Christ was meant to be used a particular way. We don't just tack on the name of Jesus to anything we're doing and expect it to be blessed. The name of Jesus was meant not just to be declared, but to be explained. It's, it's not to be tucked away in a museum or as a part of someone's collection, or uh, the name of Jesus is not just to be brushed aside as, as you look at a a college textbook on comparative religions. There's no power when you just read the name of Jesus with no context around it. The name of Jesus was meant to be explained. That's its power. How does the name of Jesus relate to the fallenness of man and us being reconciled back to God? Are we so foolish to think that there's power in the name of Jesus with no context? Are we so foolish to think that there's power in the name of Jesus to cause demons to flee? By the way, the seven sons of Sceva learned that one the hard way. There is no power in the name of Jesus when it's in its wrong context. In fact, demons laugh when the name of Jesus is cursed or taken in vain. Demons even laugh when the name of Jesus is set up as just the moral example for mankind. But when the name of Jesus is put in its correct frame as the curse bearer for us, the atoning lamb for us, the one who reverses the course of sin, there's power in that name. But when the name of Jesus is separated from the cross with no context or a negative context or an incomplete context, that's not what Paul is talking about. He's talking about explaining the name of Jesus. That's where there's power. And so, as we look at verse 29 into verse 30, it's not enough to simply do something or say something and then tack on the name of Jesus and say we're suffering, quote-unquote, for the sake of Jesus or we're suffering in the name of Jesus. The more important question is, were we giving a defense of Jesus? Were we explaining Jesus? And, and folks, this is something that in every age, Philippians 1 has been relevant. This is something that the church needs to hear, but it so desperately needs to hear it today. When so many artists, unfortunately even preachers, authors, have any message under the sun and they just tack on the name Jesus and expect their message to be blessed. You know, there's a, a very popular author today by the name of Rachel Hollis who is very gifted. Um, she's sold millions of books and there's a reason. She's 
She's an insanely good author. But Hollis has a, a direct audience for young women specifically and writes on how to be, you know, all you can be, self-confidence, that kind of thing. The only problem is that even though many times Christian young women are her audience, it is totally divorced from putting our dependence upon Jesus. And it's just self-help with Jesus tagged on. And she even writes in one of her books that while Jesus is my choice, it's not necessarily the right choice for everybody. But if Jesus helps you be the best you can be, you need to be on board with Jesus. She writes, for example, you are meant to be the hero of your own story. You should be the very first of your priorities. And, and, and I don't know if you've noticed, that tends to be a, a normal thing with many popular authors today. How can you be the best you? Here are 20 principles, and Jesus is sort of in the margin. And yet what's missing is the atoning empowerment of Jesus that he redeems us from the curse so that he can lift us up to be all we can be. That's what happens to be missing. By the way, in case you haven't noticed, no one in our culture has a problem with Jesus. The name Jesus on any talk show will get a lot of applauses when Jesus is in the agenda of what the host wants the agenda to be. There's no power in that name. But that's not the gospel. That's not complete dependence on the atoning death of Jesus. That Jesus absorbed the wrath of God in my place. That's where Paul is going here. And so, if your aim is to sell millions of books... To be honest, a very good formula would be leave out the gospel, but keep Jesus in. But that's foreign to what Paul is saying. Again, his message, you will suffer. How? By being involved in the same conflict I am. And what conflict is that? I am put here for the defense of the gospel. That's what Paul lived for. Declaring and explaining the gospel. We need not look for suffering. We need not put suffering on a pedestal or a goal. All we need to do is simply proclaim the full message of the gospel. You know, in the, in the first century A.D., the Roman Empire, which was ruling when Paul was writing here, the Roman Empire did not care what religion you belonged to. As long as you were able to pledge allegiance to Caesar. In fact, when they would do population censuses, uh, there would be a, a group of Romans lined up to do what? They would mark their name down, and then they would pick up a pinch of incense and throw it in a fire pot with this large statue of the Caesar, and they would just say out loud, Caesar is Lord, and then go about their business. They're safe. Kaiser Curios, Caesar is Lord. Roman Empire didn't care if they were Christians, if they were part of Gnostic cults, if they were part of mystery religions, if they were Jews, if they were atheists. made no difference to Rome as long as they were able to say, Caesar is Lord. But when the true Christians were in line, it wasn't taking a pinch of incense and in the name of Jesus saying Caesar is Lord that brought on the lions. It was gospel clarity that brought on the lions. It was saying, we cannot say Caesar is Lord. We cannot take up a pinch of this incense. We will not say Kaiser Curios out loud because Christ is our only Lord. That's what brought persecution. That's what brought the suffering. And so the suffering Paul is talking about is simply the byproduct of gospel clarity. If I could just give three quick questions of application this morning. First question, when was the last time I declared and explained the gospel to someone? 
Application here is not when the last time I suffered was. Don't let that be your application because suffering is not the point. It's when did I last give a defense? When was I last in the same conflict Paul was in? Which was clearly and simply saying why Jesus came to die. Question number two of application. Can I declare and explain the gospel to someone? To begin with, before I challenge us with something, let me answer that question for you. You can. You can declare and explain the gospel to someone, no matter who you are. If you're a believer here this morning, you can simply give your testimony, who you are now, who you were before you knew Christ, and even in a, your stumbling effort to remember, memorize uh, John 3.16, you can say that. Anybody here can declare the gospel. A child can declare and explain the gospel. But let me challenge us a bit, because I want to unveil the fact that in giving a defense of the gospel, the Apostle Paul had some serious tools in his back pocket. He had memorized huge chunks of the Old Testament and learned how to link them to the Messiah. He had memorized secular philosophers. He had memorized pagan poets. He knew how to weave in and out of his opponent's argument. He knew even how to get on the level of people's specific temperament and how to share the gospel. He was brilliant. And let me just challenge all of us for a moment to ask the question, are we students? Is there times during the week we give our time to books? Do we know our Bibles? Do we know, and I think it's even an appropriate question to ask at school or at work, do I know the, the five or six closest co-workers, do I know what religion they belong to? And maybe to get an understanding of where they're coming from in order for me to give a correct defense of the gospel. You know, if I had an intense heart surgery that was coming up, I want to find the best doctor possible. I want to find the best cardiologist money can buy. I don't want to find someone who has a degree from Rosedale Avenue School of Medicine.com. I want to find someone who has a degree from Harvard Medical School and went on to Johns Hopkins. I want a specialist. And how much more when we're dealing with eternal issues with our family and friends do we need to know good arguments for Christ? Which means knowing history. Which means knowing our Bible. Which sometimes means knowing philosophy. Which means how much time and serious study do I give church history? That I'm not necessarily saying formal sem seminary education is for everyone. It's not. But am I a student? Again, can I give a defense of the gospel? Final question this morning. Have I personally embraced the gospel of Jesus Christ? The apostle admonishes us this morning in verse 29 that we not only believe in Him, but also suffer for His sake. And I know that we've spent just about all morning talking about the context of suffering but we can't miss that first part. Not only believe, but also suffer for His sake. Only believe. If you're here this morning, have you taken that first step of believing? Have you come to a place where you've realized, I could never be good enough for God in myself? Have you come to the end of yourself? Have you believed upon Christ? If not, I just implore you, to get with me when the service is over. Let's talk. If you have believed upon Christ, Paul's message to you and to me this morning is you will suffer. How? By being engaged in the same conflict I am. And what conflict is that? I am put here for the defense of the Gospel. That's what God calls us to this morning. Let's pray.
Father, thank you that being the pastor of Grace Bible Fellowship, I get the honor of hearing numerous times people who have these kinds of conversations at work or at school. And I thank you that I know that the flock here does give a testimony of Christ. But I pray that this morning would be a day we're just simply challenged in it. That we would wake up again tomorrow just reminding ourselves this vapor of life that I have left, whether it's another month or another 90 years, I am put here to give a defense of the gospel. I am put here to explain Christ. And so, Father, this morning, encourage us in that And thank you that even that we cannot do without the empowerment of your Holy Spirit that has brought these words off the page to us this morning. We depend on that power in Jesus' name.